Hello, I am Dr. Stewart, and we are talking about the brain today. So, what I'll do first is we're going to kind of focus on the different parts of the brain. I'm going to draw them out, and um, I'll kind of talk about the major function of each part of the brain as we step through them. So, um, the brain is an extension of the spinal cord. You know, the spinal cord is a bundle of nerves, afferent and efferent nerves that run from the base of the skull down to about L1 or 2 in your uh, lumbar vertebrae. And that allows the body to communicate with the brain. These are sending signals to and from the, uh, the brain from the body. Well, when that spinal cord enters into the base of the skull, when it passes right through the foramen magnum, it becomes the first part of the brain, which is the brainstem. And so that's what I've drawn here in green. So everything that is in green here is going to be part of the brainstem. So I'll kind of label this brainstem. Everything in green is part of the brainstem. And in this view, we're looking at the lateral view of the brain. This is going to be the front or the anterior uh, part of the brain. This is going to be the posterior part of the brain. And we're looking at this lateral or side view. So what you'll notice is that this uh, spinal cord is going to enter into the base of the skull and it's going to form this little bulge that looks kind of like that. This first little bulge, that's the first part of the brainstem, and the name of that part is called the medulla. Okay, so um, the medulla is an interesting part of the brain because it's got a couple of different folds in it that kind of look like this. And the fibers in this medulla are really running vertically. So you're going to have these kind of fibers that are running vertically like this, and it makes up this kind of um, wrinkly, folded looking structure. So if we label this, this is the medulla. M-E-D-U-L-L-A. Medulla is right there. The foramen magnum would probably be right about here. Okay, so, and then as that medulla kind of passes through the frame and magnum, then it's the first part of the spinal cord. So let's label that. So that would be the spinal cord right there. Now, all, there's three parts of the brainstem. I've only talked about one, but all these parts of the uh, brainstem are going to have similar functions. Um, one main function that they have is they allow the spinal cord to communicate with the higher centers of the brain that we haven't talked about yet. Another important kind of function of the brainstem is that it's going to control a lot of like behind the scenes functions of the body. It's going to regulate things like um, blood pressure, you know, how, um, I guess, uh, how wide our blood vessels are. It's going to monitor things like heart rate and respiratory rate. In addition, it's going to um, control involuntary uh, behaviors like coughing and vomiting. That's all part of the brainstem. You know, and okay, well, the next part of the brainstem is, a, is another little bulge of tissue that kind of wraps around the medulla. And this next part of the brainstem is located right about there. That is called the pons. Now, the pons has fibers that are kind of wrapping around like this, so they're wrapping in a kind of a different direction in the medulla. I mean, it's not really that super important for. for you guys in this class, but just to give you a sense of how all this is kind of organized. That um, structure right there that I just drew, this guy is called the pons, P-O-N-S. And um, again, he shares a lot of these same functions as the medulla. Now, one important thing that we'll kind of mention um, next chapter is that the cranial nerves. So there's a series of 12 uh, nerves that emerge directly from the brain, and they have some really important functions, like allowing us to smile, allowing us to feel, allowing us to feel pain, even it controls like digestion. We're not going to focus on that today, but a lot of these cranial nerves, I believe like eight or nine of them, are going to emerge directly from the brainstem themselves. So they're going to have like your your vagus nerve is going to emerge like right about there. That's going to be like the site of the uh, the vagus nerve. Now. These nerves, they really consist of collections of neurons, and the cell bodies of these neurons lie in the medulla. When we talk about the function of the vagus nerve, we're really talking about the function of the medulla because the neurons that make up that vagus nerve, their cell bodies are in the medulla, right? So when you think about the function of the cranial nerves next chapter, 
it'll give us a better idea of really what the different parts of the, the brainstem accomplish. The last part of the brainstem is a little piece that sits on top of the uh, pons. This is called the midbrain. And the midbrain, kind of shaped like that, um, again, the, the most superior part of the brainstem, and he shares a lot of the jobs of the other uh, parts. So, I'm not, I don't want you guys to get too specific into the precise kind of roles of the, the midbrain versus like the pons and all that. Okay, but it kind of looks like that. And that's the brainstem. Now let's kind of jump over to this blue or purple structure. Collectively, all everything in blue uh, makes up the diencephalon. So that D I E N C E P H A L O N. The diencephalon is going to consist of a couple of different parts. Uh, one main part is this really large oval looking structure that is kind of shaped like this. So it kind of is shaped like this, he wraps around like this, he comes across the midbrain, he kind of has an extension that, that, that extends out like that. So this guy that I just drew, that is called the thalamus. It's Tyler. All right. And the thalamus has a really important role because this guy receives incoming sensory signals from other parts of the body and he tells those signals where to go. He's almost like the, the front desk of a big office building. All these things are coming in. Well, that thalamus receives a lot of these sensory signals and he's going to tell them where to go for processing. Um, one note is that one sensory pathway that avoids the thalamus, I think it's the only one, is uh, the olfactory nerve, which uh, processes smell. Okay, but still, let's think of it as like an incoming uh, relay station. Now, another uh, part of the diencephalon lies right here, kind of in front and anterior and below that uh, thalamus. This little structure that I've drawn in here, I'll kind of shade him in so he looks a little different from the, the thalamus. This is called the hypothalamus. Perfect name, hypo, below and then thalamus, thalamus. Well, that hypothalamus, he's not a huge structure in the brain, but gosh, he's super, super important. He has so many different jobs. Number one, he controls your thirst, your fluid balance, your hunger. He controls things like body temp. Another thing that that hypothalamus uh, controls is the autonomic nervous system. So your fight or flight response versus your rest and digest, that's a big deal. He is in direct control over what those two systems kind of do. And then finally, the hypothalamus is connected to a tiny little gland, which is located right here. That's called the pituitary gland, which is in this kind of reddish color. Pituitary located right here. Well, the pituitary gland is an endocrine gland. We'll learn about this in the endocrine system. And we'll learn that the pituitary gland is probably the most important endocrine gland. He releases six or seven different hormones that have really powerful effects on a lot of the other hormones in the body. They, they, it stimulates the release of other endocrine glands. So the pituitary gland has a really big kind of influence on the endocrine system. Well, guess who controls the endocrine or the pituitary gland? That is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus has a huge influence on the endocrine system as well. Just behind the thalamus is a little structure, which is going to be like right here. Not very large at all, right? I should have kind of messed up with the color in here. I'll kind of make some blue dots right there to indicate that he's part of that uh, diencephalon. That is the epithalamus. Okay, epithalamus is right here. Not nearly as important as the hypothalamus, but he does contain the pineal gland, which produces melatonin, which helps with our sleep, um, our ability to sleep in our, um, our um, you know, wake our day, night cycle. Let's jump over to this structure in orange. This structure in orange is uh, called the cerebellum. And he's a big wrinkly structure that is on the back side of the brain. So in orange, we have the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is located right about here. He connects just behind the, um, the pons. 
Okay, and so one kind of very specific job of the pons is that it allows the cerebellum and the arms to communicate with the rest of the brain. The cerebellum has a bunch of different wrinkles and folds in it. Right? And, um, you know, he's a very kind of obvious uh, part of the brain. And um, what the cerebellum does is this guy allows us to move in a coordinated way. So we'll have these outgoing motor commands that are coming from the higher parts of the brain that we haven't talked about. On their way out um, to the spinal cord, they're intercepted by the cerebellum. The cerebellum is going to help coordinate these motor commands so that we can move in a very sophisticated and kind of elegant way, right? So we can keep our balance. These outgoing motor commands are intercepted by the cerebellum, and the cerebellum is going to coordinate those so you don't fall down. If you're doing something complicated like dancing or playing soccer or football or tennis, any type of sport, the cerebellum is going to be highly active because it's going to take consideration the position of any of your limbs at any given time, and so that you can move in an effective way. If there's damage, let's say there's like a stroke or brain damage to a part of the cerebellum, the symptoms of that are going to be, you know, someone who might fall a lot, might lose their balance, move in a, in a kind of a clumsy uh, fashion. Okay. One thing that this cerebellum is going to care a lot about are the information that's encoded by proprioceptors. We, we talked about those being one of the different receptors. And these proprioceptors are going to um, send their information to the cerebellum so that it can use that. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll kind of consider the location of all the different muscles when we want to um, move in the future. Another part of the brain that we need to uh, talk about is this structure right here. All right, this guy is called the corpus callosum, and he is a collection of neurons that connect the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain. So I'm going to draw like some dots here to represent that these are axons that are kind of running back and forth like this. There's hundreds of millions of these different axons that make up the corpus callosum, but I'm just going to draw a couple dozen of these dots. Anyway, so this is the corpus, corpus callosum right there. He's really important because he allows the left half of the brain to communicate with the right half of the brain. Um, amazingly, um, folks that suffer from really horrible uh, seizures, so uh, like grand mal seizures, they may have this uh, surgically removed and that has been shown to kind of help alleviate the symptoms of some of these uh, horrible seizures. Right? Now, um, what else do we need to talk about? Oh, another part of the brain, which is really uh, important to mention, is called the uh, limbic system. So the limbic system, I'm going to draw this as, I don't know, this, like I'm going to try to paint this in yellow. So the limbic system is a series of diffuse kind of neurons that kind of encase, they go on top of the corpus callosum, they wrap around, they go kind of on the sides of the brain stem. And um, this limbic system, so I'm going to kind of draw it like this, kind of wraps around here, a diffuse, a diffuse kind of collection of neurons that kind of wraps around. This limbic system is really crucially important in our memory and our emotions. So, I mean, first off, memories are very tightly linked to emotions. If you had a really emotionally charged event, that's something that you could probably remember quite well. Okay, so in yellow, this is the limbic. System, L-I-M-B-I-C. I mean, for example, you probably can't remember what you ate for dinner three days ago, but I guarantee you, you can remember what you ate for dinner on your last like birthday dinner. That's because your birthday dinner, or you even take it up a notch to say if you got, if you've ever been married, right, on your on your wedding day, you can remember what you had that day because that was an emotionally charged event. Emotionally charged events are going to be much more effectively committed to memory. That's because the limbic system is involved in both of those different processes.
Okay. Another thing that is tightly linked to the limbic system is the olfactory bulb. This little extension right here goes right out to the nose. That's why smells are so good at eliciting a very certain emotion or even memory. They can take you back to a very specific point in time. That's because they share the exact same pathways with the limbic system that's associated with committing things to memory. The limbic system also um, kind of ties in with the hypothalamus. That um, uh, leads to another kind of role of the hypothalamus and that it's very important in um, determining our emotions, right? Because it kind of links together with the, uh, the limbic system and the hypothalamus. Now the last part of the uh, brain that I'll kind of mention, this, this is all that wrinkly stuff that we're typically used to seeing. That, those are the cerebral hemispheres and they kind of sit on top of all of these different structures. I don't want to make this drawing too messy here, but I'm going to kind of, you know, just loosely paint the, the general shape of the cerebral hemispheres. So these cerebral hemispheres are going to sit on top of all this, and they're going to kind of be in this shape right here, and it's going to wrap around and like that. And that's about all I'm going to do because I don't want to make things too you know, confusing. But these cerebral hemispheres, they're going to sit on top of all these different structures. Now, if we were to look at this same kind of um, brain, but from the frontal of the anterior view, we can really get a sense of where everything is. Okay, here you're going to have the medulla as it kind of goes down. The medulla is going to have its wrinkles in it. It's going to have all those little fibers that are running vertically, kind of like this. So that's going to be the medulla with all of his very specific fibers running like that. Medulla's right here. Again, this is the frontal or kind of anterior view. Right on top of that medulla, that's where we're going to have the pons. The pons kind of wraps around like that and it goes up. Okay, and that pons, he's going to have fibers that are kind of running left to right like this, right? Doesn't really matter. I'm not getting, I don't want to get too complicated. You guys get the idea. So that'll be the pons, and then you'll have the midbrain that kind of reaches up. Now it's important to kind of mention you're going to have two kind of sides to this midbrain. One kind of midbrain goes over to the left side, one goes to the right side. Those fibers are going to be kind of oriented in that direction right here. And then you're going to have a thalamus that exists on either side. You're going to have a thalamus on this left side over here. And you're going to have a thalamus on this right side over there. One pons, one medulla, two extensions of the midbrain, and um, a thalamus on each side. The hypothalamus is going to kind of sit in the middle right here, and that's going to connect to the pituitary gland, which is right there. I'll kind of shade this in like I did before. There's the hypothalamus right there. Sitting in the back, that's where we'll have the cerebellum. Same color code, so I'm not really too worried about the um, labeling things. Okay, so you'll have the cerebellum, might as well add his little wrinkles as they kind of go up like this. Perfect. And then all of this, oh, the corpus callosum is going to be located right here. And this is where I can really draw kind of the orientation of all of these fibers that are running side to side. So they're kind of running back and forth like this, all those hundreds of millions of different axons that allow the two hemispheres to communicate. They kind of run back and forth like that. And then finally, all this is going to be kind of covered or encased by the cerebral hemispheres, which have a general shape that looks like this. I'll go into detail about what really happens with these cerebral hemispheres in the next lecture. And those are the major parts of the brain. All right. Thank you. Oh, uh, almost over.